So good morning, Black Hat. It's been a long time since I've been here, and it's even longer since I was actually presenting at Black Hat, so it's good to be back. So yeah, we're going to be talking about Kerberos, the clues in the title. Um, just a very quick overview of who we are. If you don't know, I'm James. I work in Google in Project Zero, specializing in finding interesting bugs in Windows. Yeah, my name's Nick, and I work uh, in adversarial R&D at NetSpy. I also love finding bugs in Windows, so. So, of course, this is only a 40-minute presentation. It's quite short in, in the grand scheme of things, so we have to make some assumptions about UV audience. First, that you have a reasonable grasp of how Kerberos works or what Kerberos is, because unfortunately, we just don't have the time to actually go through that and tell you all the nitty-gritty details. We're also going to be doing some stuff which sort of is related to existing remote attacks in Kerberos. So having familiarity with those sort of parts of Kerberos is quite useful as well. And this is not a talk about attacking Kerberos remotely. This is all about privilege escalation on the local machine. So if that's not really your thing, then unfortunately it may not be the talk for you. So let's actually start with a bit of a backgrounder on where we're going to go with this presentation. So Kerberos is designed for authenticating remote clients to remote servers. However, in Windows at least, there's nothing actually stopping you using Kerberos to authenticate to the same machine. So when you log on to your Windows machine, join, domain join Windows machine, uh, you make a request out to the, the key distribution center uh, with, your, with knowledge of your password, and that generates something called a ticket granting ticket. And this is then used to uh, make authentication requests to other services. Inside that ticket granting ticket is something called a privileged attribute certificate, or PAC. And this contains basically your user identity. It contains who you are, what group you're a member, member of. So when we want to actually do Kerberos authentication, we wouldn't actually just physically go out and use TCP sockets to talk to the KDC. Instead, we'd use something called the SSPI interface which is a way of communicating between user mode and LSAS, which will be LSA, which is our local security authority, which is where basically authentication happens on Windows. So what we'd usually do is call the function initialize security context. And this would make a request to, to the LSA and call into the Kerberos DLL, which is running inside the LSA process. It takes your TGT and you say, OK, I want to make a service authentication request to a local service, please. So for that, you need something called a service principal name. And this is like a descriptor of which service you want to talk to. So in this case, we're going to host slash ABC, which is a service principal name which is owned by the current system. And Kerberos packages up this request into a ticket granting server request packet, sends it to the KDC. The KDC takes that service principal name and uses it to look up a long-term key. And this key is actually a derivation of the computer account password for your local system. So every, every domain joined system has a computer account which has a password, and from that, a key is derived. Now, this key is then used to encrypt your service ticket. And what the KDC also does is it can verify that that pack that it receives, um, it can decrypt its TGT, and it copies that pack, that group information, out of there into your service ticket. So when you send it to the service with uh, a different type of Kerberos packet, the AP request, the server can call another LSA function, accept security context, which will take the computer key it knows about, because this is the local system, decrypt the ticket, extract the pack, and then use that pack to generate a Windows access token. And this can then be used to impersonate the user on the local system and perform operations on their behalf. However, the problem here is we've not gained anything. Like that pack which we authenticated with is just our pack. So it has only the groups that we were granted by the KDC in the first place. We've gained no privileges by doing this. However, there is an existing attack, uh, a remote attack, which allows you to basically specify an arbitrary pack. And that's called the silver ticket attack. So let's see how that would apply locally. Well, first, we need a key of some kind. But we don't know the computer account's key. But it turns out we do know a key. We know our user's key, because 
every user in Kerberos has its own key derived from their password. So we take our password, we authenticate to LSA, we can then in our own process generate that same key, it requires nothing other than the password, and we can just completely build a fake ticket for an arbitrary service. And this has a pack which can contain anything we like, and then we put, we ourselves call accept security context, and we get privilege escalation because we can say we're, we're an admin, so please give us admin on the, on the machine, we impersonate that token, and that's it, job done. Simple. So let's see that actually in action. So I've got a Windows 10 machine here, and I've written a lot of uh, .NET code. Uh, I'll, show, I'll give you a link to where a lot of this code li lives later on, but we're just using PowerShell here to interact with that. And it's, very, it's relatively simple. We build some basic uh, configuration. We then derive the key based on the password we've passed in. And then I've written a function, new Kerberos silver ticket, which will take that key, take what groups you want to be, what user SID you want to be, and just build one of these fake tickets. So we'll never talk to the KDC at all. Uh, next, we then build an AP request, um, which will allow us to then call accept security context. And then there's just some code here which passes that AP request with the silver ticket uh, to LSA, and hopefully we get back from here, we can just ask the server context for, hey, can you give me that access token back, please? So we can just run that. We do need to know the user's password, but in this particular case, we know the user's password is password two. Uh, we, can, we actually uh, are unclear on that. We can do get NT token. So I'm, I'm the Bob user. And he's password two. Oops. Got to make sure it's uh, the correct capitalization. So that, that has worked, and we can actually, uh, I've got a nice little GUI. You can just bring up uh, the token information, and this is Bob and his groups. So if we run silver ticket, our silver ticket script, uh, we put in the password of password two, and it doesn't work. Uh, well, that's, that's not a good start to the presentation. Fortunately, this is expected. So I will pass you now on to Nick, who's actually going to explain why it's expected. Yeah, so if we look at the error message, it's pretty generic. Obviously, we could make some guesses about maybe our code being incorrect or the ticket we're ultimately building being invalid in some way. Uh, but actually, where we have to go is into the internals of LSA, specifically this Kerberos security package, to understand where it's failing. And we'll give you a head start on this one. The issue stems from a thing called pack signature validation. Obviously, James. Uh, discussed what a pack is, and it effectively contains user information, like privileged groups. Well, that information is pretty sensitive, so uh, tickets secure this in an additional way by signing the pack with, technically, it includes three signatures, we're only gonna focus on two. And when a machine wants to validate a pack, it can take the same key that was used to issue the service ticket, uh, calculate a local checksum value, and then simply do a comparison against the server signature. Now we have control over that key because the key is derived from the user's password, so that's not where it's failing. Where it's failing is in this curb verify pack request where effectively the KDC signature and the local checksum value get shipped off via net logon uh, over to the KDC where it can use its curb TGT key to validate that the KDC signature, which is actually a checksum of a checksum, is valid and it can return that result back to the machine. <clears throat> so this leaves you with an interesting question, which is why do silver tickets ever work? What are the requirements for getting silver tickets to work? Because we're always forging packs in those. Uh, the answer is pack validation isn't always enabled. And we've categorized three rough buckets where this pack validation does get disabled. The first one derives from your logon session. So if you're in a quote system equivalent logon session, you have TCB privileges, you're running as local or network service. Uh, there's one that stems from your credential handle, specifically a flag on the credentials handle, uh, this cred attribute pack bypass flag. It can be applied manually to a credentials handle if you have TCB privileges, and it's also applied automatically in some specific instances that has to do with the service SID. Um, so, you know, we're talking again about service accounts, IS, app pool users, things like that. And there's a strange bucket at the very bottom that stems from a flag on the context that says ASC ret use session key. 
Now, if you go into MSDN, you get a really generic answer for what this flag ultimately does, and it has something to do with keys derived from keys, but we certainly want to start digging into this because it seems like something we might be able to control. <clears throat> Luckily, if we jump over into 4120 of the Kerberos RFC, we can find references to a flag use session key that's applied in AP rec messages. And it effectively says that when this flag is in use, the ticket is encrypted with the session key um, from the server's TGT rather than the server's secret key or its long-term key. Um, they refer to this as user to user authentication. So for the remainder of the presentation, you'll hear us say user to user or U to U. It effectively refers to this process where you have the curb TGT key, which is used to issue a ticket granting ticket with a pack. And instead of another service ticket or the, the service ticket that gets issued on behalf of that TGT being signed with the server's long-term key, uh, the session key is instead extracted from the ticket granting ticket and used instead. Now, both of these are information that you know are pretty lined up. Like if you have the session key for a TGT, you would generally expect to have the user's password. Um, but we want to get the session key, and it's not necessarily as easy as we might hope. So we're doing all of this because we want to disable pack validation, but if we're logged in as a user and we actually go and ask LSA to give us a TGT with a session key, uh, we'll unfortunately be left with a bunch of null bytes. And this is a security protection that LSA puts in place because a TGT is functionally like a password, right? Like having a ticket granting ticket lets you authenticate to services on behalf of a user. So it would be like querying LSA for a, a short-term password or, or a, the user's long-term key. Lucky for us, this problem has already been solved in some form uh, by a trick called TGT delegate um, or unconstrained delegation TGT extraction. And we won't belabor this particular layout too much or exactly what's going on here. But functionally, what we're abusing is the fact that LSA protects the ticket granting ticket uh, very well, but it doesn't protect service tickets quite as well. And there are particular instances where a service ticket is marked for uh, effectively a delegatable ticket, and it will embed the entire TGT and session key of the target user into that ticket. So we can effectively ask initialized security context to build us a service ticket for any service on the KDC. That host is marked with unconstrained delegation. The uh, outgoing service ticket will effectively have the TGS as well as an authenticator value that's encrypted with the session key from the ticket itself. And we can get that session key fine because it's a service ticket. And inside of that authenticator is a checksum value, which is actually not a checksum. It's a GSS checksum structure, which contains a curb cred structure. So, this is great. We now have a way to get an active TGT and its session key from LSA. And we also believe that the use of this session key when we're signing our silver ticket should result in arbitrary pack data bypassing validation. So the last question we have to ask is, what are we actually going to do to the pack to get admin? We know the pack is critical. We know it contains critical information. Uh, the substructure we're going to focus on is this logon info structure. It effectively contains all of the information for what RIDs and the domain SID, effectively all the IDs that locate uh, or identify user privileges. So the ones up top are pretty self-explanatory. You also have extra SIDs and resource domain SIDs. SID filtering, if you've heard of that before, applies to all of this, and there's a lot of nuances there, which James has uh, uh, beautifully documented out there. But for the most part, we're actually just going to focus on adding arbitrary group RIDs. So we can add things like the 500 and 512 RID, which apply to the domain SID that the user is in, and functionally becoming domain administrator on most local machines would also make you regular admin. So I'll pass things back over to James, and he's going to see if we can get pack validation disabled properly this time. So yes, we can um, go to another demo. So in this particular case, it's user to user. OK, so it's pretty much exactly the same code as we, we've just seen. Uh, the main crucial difference is we call a function I wrote get user TGT, and that performs basically that exact attack that Nick has just described, where you uh, get a delegation uh, AP request, decrypt it, and return the TGT with its own session key. Um, we can then extract the session key from that, and this will, of course, be now non-zero. And then instead of our long-term key, so of course, at this point, we no longer need the password, so it's kind of a useful benefit as well of doing this, that you no longer need that user's password to perform this attack. Uh, you can call the new uh, Kerberos Silver Ticket function with the session key instead of the TGT, uh, instead of the password key, derived key. And then basically, almost everything else is exactly the same. Uh, we make sure that the local Kerberos ticket cache has our TGT just to make sure that it's definitely going to use our TGT rather than one of the other TGTs the user has. 
and then we just call accept security context with our silver ticket and hopefully it all just uh, works magically. So we come back to here and as I say we don't need to pass a password. The uh, script itself will always set by default uh, we want to add domain admin groups. The main admin groups is useful because we can't admin due to SID filtering we can't add the local admin group but if we add the domain admin group then by default all domain join machines have local administrator the local administrator group contains the domain admin group so that will give us domain admin. We also make sure that we set the integrity level to medium. Um, close that down and we run that and no errors. Hallelujah, right? All right. I think we're done. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that's the end of our presentation. Thank you very much for coming. So uh, we can see possibly in here, um, or I can just show it here. I can do N get NT token groups and from token, and we can see that we are now built-in administrators. So what's not to like? Um, so my tooling has an invoke NT token function uh, which takes uh, an, a an access token and will impersonate it for you and run a PowerShell script while impersonating that, that script. So we can go and try and write to say the Windows folder. Set content, uh, Windows, test.txt. And so this should have now given us privilege escalation. However, <laughs> We've now got another error. And again, unfortunately this is, this is not intended but is unfortunately a byproduct of what we've done. And it's all talking about impersonation levels and that's, that's not usually a good sign. So let's pass it back to Nick for, uh, to continue the discussion. All right, we're getting closer here. Um, and I'm actually going to pull out an old diagram. It's one of my favorites of James where uh, he's meticulously laid out all of the uh, flows for checking whether or not one particular uh, entity can impersonate a token. Um, now, this is a long list and they sort of feed into each other, but we can certainly start going through it and thinking about where we might start running into issues with this token that we've built. Well, up first, the token level being under impersonate doesn't apply here. We also don't have SE impersonate privileges, so we wouldn't get the immediate bypass. Uh, the token IL and the token user can both be controlled by the pack and when James was looking at it everything looked fine. Like it said we were domain Bob, uh, the, the token integrity level was medium, we just had domain admin groups on it. The elevation check beyond that is ignored if the user is not a C UAC admin, which we're not. Um, and there's this last interesting check which we can also all thank James for and it's one final check on the token that looks to see if the target token attempting to be impersonated exists in session zero and the user's session who is attempting to impersonate the token is not session zero. Uh, this is actually a really common thing. Uh, using loopback authentication to manipulate tokens on Windows is a known attack and in response Microsoft has blocked session zero tokens from being impersonated anywhere else. And if you didn't know, network authentication tokens go into session zero uh, by default. So we have an issue and we're persistent. Now we're looking for instances where a token would be moved from one session to another. Uh, there are probably a lot of places we could look for this information. We're going to start just in the LSAS server and we're going to look for instances where it calls NT set information token with a token session ID info class. It's probably a good first start. Now granted there could be a million security packages or weird dynamically loaded code that does this, but we end up with a nice little flow chart and we can start going through it and investigating. Well the bottom function that looks super juicy, the update user token session ID is unfortunately locked behind TCB as you would imagine. Uh, the LSAP set session token isn't particularly useful here. It doesn't really migrate tokens between sessions. It's just for duplicating a token and applying it to a logon session. The LSAP build and create token and filter elevated token full both tend to deal with elevated and linked uh, tokens, so things that would be related to UAC split tokens. Uh, we could maybe get something useful going on here, but we'd really like to ignore UAC. It's just a pain for this whole thing. So we're left with this really interesting flow uh, from LSAP create token EX into a really unique function called LSAP apply loopback session ID. Now what's particularly unique about this flow is the LSAP create token EX is exactly where our call flow already goes. That's what accepts security context and the Kerberos package calls underneath when the token is finally ready to get built. So James and I started wondering what is this function and what does it do? Well lucky for you we've effectively reversed it and understood its implementation to some regard. 
Essentially, it's a tracking mechanism to identify instances just like ours. It's to identify instances where a client and a server are talking to each other on the same machine and for some reason the protocol hasn't identified that it's what we would call loopback authentication and this is probably in re response to maybe some sort of token uh, session ID uh, refactoring code uh, but regardless it's really unique when a user calls into initialized security contracts, a begin tracking function gets called and effectively a entry gets added to this table with the session ID of the user. And when the buffer is being returned back out of initialized security context, and remember the buffer we know is an AP rack, but depending on the protocol, this could be any, you know, network protocol buffer. That buffer also gets fed into update tracking and a hash value gets rolling. And this is a uh, pretty solid hashing. It uses like random GUIDs directionally and it's built on AES CMAX, so we're probably not going to attack the hashing function itself. And when the accept security context function gets called, that AP rack that was passed out of LSAS is passed back in, begin tracking gets executed, and then when a token is being built, uh, the code will effectively reference this table to find instances where the hashes match. And in that case, it has identified an instance where buffers were passed out of LSAS to a client and then passed immediately back into LSAS from a server somewhere on the host. So this is looking really promising to us. Uh, we now have a primitive where we can get a token moved between sessions and it applies to our situation nicely. But uh, we have a few caveats. One is we need to start calling initialized security context, which James has pointed out we don't do. Thus far, we've just been building the AP recs manually in PowerShell and submitting them via accept security context, but we need to get that hash value rolling so that the function can actually line them up later on. And we're kind of left with a conundrum where we need to modify the pack inside of the AP rec, which would imply that we're modifying the buffers. But if we touch the buffers, the hash lookup will break and our token will be locked away from us. Uh, so we kind of have this no fly zone around our code and the security context functions. Well, we had curiosities about how exactly this tracking mechanism worked. And if you dig into it, you find that for every security buffer descriptor transiting in and out of LSAS, the hashing code will only be interested in buffers where the buffer type matches exactly sec buffer token. In other words, it's the token type. And that's, for those who aren't familiar with those APIs, what would hold your AP rec or your NTLM challenge response. Luckily for us, there's actually a high attribute byte um, in this sec buffer type, and it can hold things like whether or not the buffer is read only or read only with a checksum. So we have the token value, yes, but we can also bitwise or it with, say, a sec buffer read only flag and maybe break some assumptions about whether or not the hashing code would use our buffer. And we've done exactly that. It's effectively a type confusion and accept security context where you have a buffer descriptor that contains two buffers in it. Both are marked with token, but the former buffer is bitwise ORed with this read only flag. So we can put our modified AP rec data in there, our malicious data, and the benign data that we got out of LSAS in the second uh, buffer. And the loopback library will refer to the second buffer when it's doing the hash lookup and hashing code. And Kerberos will actually use the first buffer because it masks away the upper attribute byte when trying to find a token. So third time's a charm. We have a primitive for getting the tokens moved. Uh, I'll pass it to James to see if we can finally get this working. Okay, so we can now see um, there's a fake buffer script. And again, we get the t user's TGT, but uh, the crucial thing here is instead of uh, using, um, we're not going to use our modified AP request directly. So we create this fake client for our AP request. And then we actually have to call, as Nick said, initialize security context. So we both set up a client and a server authentication context to talk to LSAS. But the crucial thing here is we have to do a few updates because user to user actually has like a few ancillary tokens that we need to make sure are negotiated. But once that's over and done with, uh, we can actually then build two security buffers. The first one, which we want Kerberos to see, is type token but is read only and contains our fake AP request with our silver ticket. And then we build an LSA buffer, which we want the LSA hashing algorithm to, work, uh, to see. And because the LSA code doesn't know anything really about the package it's talking to, it just goes, oh, okay, I'll just, ha I'll just hash that one. It gets mistaken and only hashes the one we give it. And so hopefully this should then actually uh, allow us to get a token in our own session ID. So we do token uh, fake buffer. And again, we don't need to pass a password. We got no errors. No errors are good. Uh, if we actually look at the session ID, it's now, the previous one was zero, and now it's two. 
And it doesn't have to be, strictly speaking, our own session ID. It just has to be non-zero. That's, that's the only criteria. So if we scroll back and go back to that, uh, fingers crossed, it should now work. Hey. We get no errors. And we can then just read that back just to make sure that we actually wrote something. Test.text, hello world. And, and there we go. All right, this is well and good, but James and I aren't ones for uh, uh, leaving it there when we discovered in Windows 11 that in the loopback hashing code, they actually mask out that upper attribute byte, so they're doing things properly. Uh, we're not entirely sure why. We have our suspicions this was due to some refactoring code, and we actually think that it was maybe fixed in Windows 11 as a response to other refactoring and not actually a security fix, which is why it hasn't been backported. But either way, our double buffer trick is not gonna work in Windows 11. And, you know, James and I, James in particular is a huge fan of Windows 11. He wants to make sure all of his tools work there. <laughs> And we return to this diagram where we have this sort of no-fly zone. We have to sit here and think, well, all right, if we're not allowed to modify the buffers when they transit in and out of LSAS, maybe we can modify some of, something about the ticket or the token as it transits to the KDC. Um, in fact, we have all of the key material necessary to do a man-in-the-middle attack here, right? Like, we're the ones who have the session key to the user-to-user -user ticket. We could decrypt it in transit. So we could have a KDC shipping back a valid pack inside of a TGS rep. If we could get in the middle somehow, uh, we could use our session key, unlock the pack, modify the, the group RIDs, and then package it all back up and ship it off to the machine. The machine would then cache that ticket, and when it was used for the AP rack and we could just self-negotiate, uh, we're not actually needing to modify the ticket at that point, because as it stands in LSA, as it's stored in LSA, it's malicious. But we're left with another problem here, especially when we think about Windows 11, which is that Credential Guard is on by default. And also, we like thinking about how to break uh, Credential Guard and related things. So this affects our kill chain thus far because it prevents unconstrained delegation in Kerberos, which was the trick we were using to get the session key with our TGT. So now we're kind of back to square one a little bit. We need the key material for the user to user ticket, but we can't access the session key for the TGT. And James had the great idea of maybe just bringing your entire own KDC. Uh, it's worth questioning whether or not we even need to talk to a real KDC. Um, there certainly seems to be a lot of flexibility in the way packs are processed. And if we want to make this work extra nicely, rather than using it on an external host or uh, resolving Kerberos via DNS to an external host, we can instead use a nice feature called KDC pinning, which is effectively a request that we send into LSAS, and we can bond a particular realm and bind it to a, a host name. In this case, we're probably interested in doing localhost because we want to run a KDC locally. Now, if you were crazy enough to write an entire KDC in .NET and then expose that KDC in PowerShell, uh, you could have an attack where the entire ticket key material from start to finish is controlled by you. And when we call into uh, LSA, we can pin this KDC or this fake realm uh, to localhost. And then when we supply credentials and start issuing tickets, when Kerberos goes to make a socket call, it will instead talk back to the local machine on port 88. And because we're binding on localhost, the firewall is not an issue typically here. And we now own all of the key material from the curb TGT to the user password long-term keys to the session keys and the TGTs. Um, and we can start issuing packs with arbitrary data. And what's even more interesting is those packs or the information in it don't even have to match or doesn't even have to match uh, the service ticket the domain was actually issued for. So. Uh, let's see if we can take this attack one step further. So, yeah, so now we're on Windows 11. Um, so uh, the script is somewhat different now because, of course, we're no longer just building a silver ticket in, in, in user space. We are actually, like, constructing an entire KDC, but I have tried to write uh, the the .NET classes and the PowerShell module in a relatively easy to use way, as relative as uh, a KDC uh, <laughs> can be. Because I did initially look at things like uh, using Samba's uh, uh, KDC, uh, but it doesn't really support user to user properly. So that, that was, I wasn't gonna start writing Samba code, so um, sorry about that. Um, so all we do here, we specify our fake realm, uh, we have a password of password, because it can be anything. It, we don't need to honor the uh, current password uh, complexity requirements for, for your domain, which is a useful feature. <laughs> um, and just we, we build a user, and then it, literally with that user, you call new Kerberos KDC server. 
can give it the realm, give it the domain SID and your list of users and you just start it and it just sits there running on localhost. Um, we can then add the pin. So we pin that realm, so any request by LSA in our current, from our current thread and process uh, for that realm will go to actually localhost. So we'll go to our local KDC. And then we pretty much just do a standard loopback authentication request. Uh, we have to pass our fake credentials to LSA, but it will, it will quite happily like use those and go, oh, the pin, I can just talk to the KDC on localhost, no problems. And then we get the, the access token at the end and hopefully everything's good. So just to, dem just to prove that I'm not cheating, um, we call get computer info and one of the properties in that is device guard, uh, where is it? So security service is running. So we're running credential guard. And if we actually run our previous one, um, so because we got that, we can't actually uh, get the user's TGT. So there is a, a simple get user TGT script I've written just to uh, do that attack. And we can't get the delegation TGT. OK. So our current attack vector is, 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 at, is a problem. So. Instead, we run our KDC attack. We run that. No errors. Always a good sign. Uh, we have session ID of two. Uh, we can see our groups. Uh, we are a main member of the built-in administrators. Awesome. And so we can obviously impersonate this to verify that we've actually got privilege escalation Bye bye, cred guard. Set content, windows, uh, cred.text. And no errors. So, just to check that again, I'm not, no sleight of hand, bye bye, cred guard. And we've basically done it even with cred guard enabled without ever knowing the user's password. So let me just wrap this up. Unfortunately, if you go and try this today, it won't work. And that's because Microsoft actually fixed the issue yesterday. Uh, basically, <laughs> I may have been slightly cheating with the VMs. They weren't up to date. <laughs> um, so they basically, what they've done is they've effectively removed that user to user flag check. And it's not even clear why this even existed in the first place, but it's one of those things that it's been there because some customer at some point needed this feature. Uh, it, it can be re-enabled by changing one of the configuration knobs in Kerberos. Um, you can just go into the Kerberos DLL and find out what the name of that is. As far as I know, it's undocumented at the moment because uh, it's probably one of these things that Microsoft will only tell you about if you have this particular problem in, a, in an enterprise environment. Um, so effectively, our um, attack has gone, which is a bit of a shame, but this is the whole point of security research is to get things fixed. But of course, there's possibilities that these types of bugs will happen again. And we sort of thought about, okay, what sort of mitigations can we kind of think of here? And none of them are perfect, but you can, you can apply some of them in an enterprise environment. So the first one is there's a, there's a flag, if you look back at that previous slide, um, you can, if you're a, a non-system service, so you're like a, a sort of an IIS pool user or you're a virtual service account, uh, you can still bypass pack validation by having the service SID as one of your groups. Um, but you can actually disable that feature. So there is a configuration knob for Kerberos which says, actually, no, turn this off because it's, it's bad for me. However, it really doesn't prevent local service and network service or system from accepting packs with modified, uh, for accepting tickets with modified packs. So it's not a perfect solution necessarily. Certainly won't prevent uh, silver ticket attacks generally. Um, you can also turn on, you gotta force Kerberos armoring or sometimes called fast. Uh, this would make it harder to tamper with network traffic between the clients and the KDC because it's sort of signed by the computer account's password. Uh, so 
obviously we didn't really need it in this it wouldn't have really affected us directly but if you force it on a client so that it can't talk to a KDC which doesn't have Kerberos armoring enabled, then our KDC attack would fail because it just can't, it would just reject our KDC as being invalid. Um, now, we obviously demonstrated a way of around Credential Guard, but I, we still think it has value. Like, there's plenty of things that you can do with that TGT session key that are probably perhaps not even realized at the moment, and there's already some attacks. So just turning that on has obviously a benefit that it makes it harder to extract key material generally, and also blocking this unconstrained delegation attack is also quite useful. Uh, and then finally, like, uh, even if they remove, say, the pinning attack, uh, the pinning trick, uh, you can still use, like, DNS records to configure your, your fake KDC somewhere out on the inter internet. So having, like, enterprise firewall rules which say, only allow this client to talk to known KDCs is probably a good idea. So on the detection side of things, that was mitigation. So how can you detect these attacks uh, occurring? And there's not great options. Like probably the best we found is in the security log, there's this event 4672, which basically says this user has been effectively granted administrator style privileges. And of course, if uh, a domain user who isn't a local admin on that machine suddenly is getting lo local admin groups or local admin privileges, there's probably a problem that you might want to look at. So I'm sure probably if you, if you go looking, there's probably something else interesting you can find, but that's the best we could come up with. And of course, this is only a 40-minute presentation. We had lots of uh, things we, we couldn't talk about. Um, there's a link to my, my tooling, but also various links to things like UAC bypasses, using Kerberos ticket manipulation, uh, remote credential guard code execution, like arbitrary code execution and LSAS, because why not? Um, Appetena escapes, etc. So uh, obviously the slides will be out and you can, you can find those links directly. Acknowledgements, there's plenty of people who work in the Kerberos space and has found many of the things that we build up our, uh, our own work upon. So these are, of course, the people we are, we are grateful for. And I'm sure there's plenty of people we forgot on this slide. But it would be rude of me to leave without showing one more thing, um, as is tradition. Um, so let me just go back to Windows 11. Um, I do have a snapshot updated to yesterday. And Hyper-V is thinking about it. Um, so it's kind of like, OK, they've blocked our way of bypassing pack validation, right? Well, is there any other interesting way we can, we can get around this? So let's connect to here. Go on, Hyper-V. Oh, there we go. Um, so obviously we log in as Bob, because Bob is our non-admin user, because Again, we can't have them as UAC admin because that, ironically, we can't impersonate an admin token if we're in a UAC user because you can bypass UAC or so, I don't know. Very strange. Right. Okie dokie. So, we go to, oops. We go to our pox directory and as I say, this is updating. So if we run our KDC attack, um, it fails, as you'd expect. So it's removed our silver ticket attack. However, if we do uh, one last thing, and it's kind of giving, giving away that this is still a silver ticket attack of sorts, because we still need to use this password. Um, huh, interesting. <laughs> so we have a look at the session ID. We get his token groups. Oh. He's an administrator, that's a shame. <laughs> and just to prove a point, um, ha, ha. <laughs> Set content, Windows test.txt. And there we go.
So before anyone asks, I did report that to Microsoft yesterday. Um, unfortunately, it's one of those things that I couldn't really report it because I didn't know whether it was a bug until they fixed the bug that we were like, bypassing to fix. Anyway, needless to say, um, it was a bit of a last run thing. Um, so that is the end of our presentation. Thanks very much for, uh, for attending. I really appreciate it. And I'm sure Nick appreciates it. Yeah, thanks, everyone. I really, really appreciate everyone coming. And we had a lot of fun with this. And definitely check out all the material we skipped out on. So. We had so much we wanted to put in this presentation, and we couldn't get to it. Yeah. Um, and I'll try and uh, put up the, uh, the example scripts sometime uh, later next week. So thank you very much, and uh, have a good rest of your day.